This week on Heroes, made in the USA. Rock drummer Keith Knudsen has staged several fundraising events for troubled Vietnam vets, but his crowning achievement was reuniting his former group, the Doobie Brothers. Bob Burton transforms juvenile delinquents into stable young adults during rugged wagon train expeditions to remote pockets of the American wilderness. Like a typical hero, Dr. Robert Gale didn't wait to be asked. After hearing of the Chernobyl disaster, he volunteered his services. Hi, I'm Joe Namath. Welcome to Heroes Made in the USA. Our first hero is former Doobie Brothers drummer Keith Knudsen. He used to make music for a living. Now he also makes it for a cause, the disadvantaged Vietnam vets in America. Now recently, Keith reunited the Doobie Brothers in a benefit concert, giving new meaning to a wonderful line from Shakespeare. If music be the food of love, play on. Between 1970 and 1982, the Doobie Brothers reigned as one of America's top rock acts. Recently, all 12 Doobies reunited for a very special project. Would you welcome Keith Good evening. I just want to take a minute to tell you, if you don't know, I want to let you know why we're all here. I called all the Doobies up to ask them to get back together to do this concert for Vietnam veterans. One of the Vietnam veterans who inspired Keith Knudsen to provide this musical reunion was David Carver. During the past 17 years, David had struggled with his war experiences in the VA hospital. Before the war, he wanted to be a performer, and Keith gave him that opportunity. I have 16 friends that I can name by name that are, are dead because of suicide. I am not. Because I've had my music, my poetry, my painting, whatever else I do, I've had that outlet. I could be alone without being alone. Vietnam psychological officer Shad Mashad works with David along with thousands of other veterans. He founded the Vietnam Veterans Aid Foundation to focus on the issues of the institutionalized and homeless veterans. It was Shad's book, Captain for Dark Mornings, that inspired Keith's involvement with Vietnam vets. I think there were two major problems. One was the experience in Vietnam, the type of war it was, and being a, a high school graduate for the most part, and not having uh, really a, a war that America was proud of or felt like was a war that we could win or would win. The second thing was the coming home. That was uh, the key thing. The fact that America confused the warrior with the war and sort of turned their backs on the veteran as he came back. Keith Knudsen didn't turn his back. He offered to chair an ongoing entertainment committee to help raise money for the Vietnam Veterans Aid Foundation. He also encouraged David Carver to write a song, Homeless Heroes, to open the reunion concert. Ladies and gentlemen, David Carver. I've lived all my life for this moment. It's a chance to say something to America. How many Vietnam vets are listened to? 300,000 survived the wounds that opened up their flesh. While there haven't been more still during the nightmares of war, then there is no rest. I was particularly moved by, you know, the plight that the vets are having since they've gotten back. I've been telling a lot of people, and this I feel myself, that. This concert, this benefit, is not about the Vietnam War, the politics of the Vietnam War, right or wrong, won or lost. It's about the warrior, about the guys and the men and women who went over there and fought and died and were wounded, and psychologically, physically, however. If I could do something to help, this was it. Keith Knudsen is making it happen. 
he has put together and has locked in the first reunion in five years of the Doobie Brothers. And it will be our first major fundraiser, which gets us on the map in, in, a, in a situation to take action on veterans, Vietnam veteran projects around the country. And it's just incredible what he's been able to do. Earlier this year, Keith volunteered the appearance of several of his friends to perform for the Homeless Heroes Feast, which fed 2,500 homeless veterans in Los Angeles. At the same time, he was organizing the Doobies reunion and recording another album with his new band, Southern Pacific. Grandma grew up like a lemony Jane, doing things different, wearing her name on shirts. <laughs> you wrote it, yeah. Mississippi Penny. The group that I play with now, um, Southern Pacific, we're working on our third album, and the Stubby Brothers concert has taken a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of, you know, a lot of telephone work and a lot of a lot of kind of things that I really am not used to doing. Usually, you have the managers do it or the uh, you know the publicity department do it and stuff like that. This is stuff that I've been hands on since the beginning because I want to make sure the money went where it was supposed to go and the most awareness could be raised in the public side. Getting all twelve doobies together is a bigger undertaking than most fans realize but Keith Knudsen did it. Through Chad's educating Keith on what the, the VVAF is all about, and then Keith in turn educating most of the guys in the band and, and doing a lot of footwork of calling us and getting us all together, this really all came about, and um, there he is now. Uh-oh. <laughs> Ugly as hell, but he's a yeah. real hero. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, he's the reason we're, we're doing this and why we're back together, and uh, it's, it's gonna be a great time. Keith was really the guy that made everybody see, no matter what their political view was, that there was a big problem and that we had to take care of the problem. The Hollywood Bowl sold out in four hours, raising over a quarter million dollars for the Vietnam Veterans Aid Foundation. And because of the efforts and dedication of Keith Knudsen, 17,000 people listened to the music of the doobie. It really is so little compared to what Vietnam has did for me and, and my family and everybody else. You know, they went over there and they died and they, they were wounded. They came back mentally, physically scarred. I don't know, I just feel like it's something I can give back to them, you know, so even, no matter how small it is. Coming up next on Heroes Made in the USA, Bob Burton works the delinquency out of juveniles and Dr. Robert Gale looks back on the Chernobyl disaster. Years ago, young American Indians participated in a special rite of passage to adulthood. They spent several days in the outdoors, relying only on themselves for survival. Our next hero, Bob Burton, has made this same concept work in a very contemporary way. The Vision Quest was a way for children to go into adulthood with a rite of passage. And it was putting them in an isolated situation where they had to experience the emotions of being alone for several days. Former corrections officer Bob Burton has started a modern day Vision Quest, a physical and emotional challenge for city kids that aren't cutting it in today's society. I created Vision Quest as an alternative to the traditional system because working in the traditional system, I saw that kids had no way of finding out some of the deeper feelings that they were going through because the environment was based on fear. Burton became frustrated by juvenile facilities that took bad kids in for treatment and left them worse than when they arrived. His system, Vision Quest, takes kids referred by social and legal agencies and puts them into nature. Most of the emotional issues that have to be faced in an impact camp are exactly the same issues that they have to face back on the streets. And by toughing it out in the outdoors, these kids grow up. I'm going to push myself probably more than I've ever pushed myself and just try to go for it. A year ago, Eric was a runaway, arrested for car burglary. Well, a year ago, I probably couldn't look at myself doing something like that, even if they tried to pay me for it. A couple of times, I felt like just giving up on it and stuff. And just, people kept me going around here. Yeah. One of the main objectives of Bob Burton's one-year program is the completion of a four-month, 2,000-mile wagon train. 
But before they can even think about that, these kids have to succeed in at least two high impact programs, like learning outdoor skills in a wilderness camp or learning to run 26 miles in a marathon. All together, since I've been training, I've run probably a total of about 70 miles. About the hardest day we've had on the quest was uh, we did like an eight mile run and then we had a short like break and then we did another seven miles. 26 miles is a long way. It's gonna be hard, you know, it's gonna be a lot of pain, but I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna try. <laughs> In addition to the tough physical commitment, Bob Burton requires an emotional one as well. If you can't hack the program for a year, stay clean and sober, and be able to take a long, hard look at your life, then you're back on the streets. But it's even harder than that. To make a wagon train work, you have to work. You gotta harness your horse, you gotta saddle it before you even eat and then get on the road and do 20 miles, then get into camp, set your house up, and then go to school. But when the going gets rough, Bob Burton and the Vision Quest staff are there for support, kind of like the parent that many of these kids never had. We parent these kids here in Vision Quest. We don't go home at 5 o'clock at night. We go through the night with them on the wagon train, and that's probably the biggest uh, convincer that when they, they see us care emotionally and we stay through the problems with them. Continue to grow. You don't want to, you come to me and told me that, okay? And then all of a sudden, I see this here, and the next one's going to be even tougher. And sometimes being a parent requires it, it a little no discipline. Way. It is no way. Hey, Marpio, Marpio, there's no way. I can't, and listen, you got to hear this out. You got to hear this, because right now, this ain't nothing yet. Yeah. We're there when they need the question answered, or they need to be caught at something, or they need to be confronted with some feelings. I'm learning that I have to be my own father deep inside, you know, because my mom's not always going to be around. You know, I'm going to have to take controls. You know, of myself, I can't let other people control me. You know, I gotta take controls of my own life. Discipline only works when it comes with another ingredient, love. These kids are beginning to open up, to become close. Well, the fear of closeness usually comes out of abandonment or abuse. And it's not just a minor kind of abandonment. I mean, it's a major abandonment. The way to reach the kind of kid that we're dealing with is through the, the time it takes to have them experience certain kinds of success in the kind of impact programs that we operate. In Vision Quest, history once again proves itself the great teacher. Following Indian tradition, Bob Burton leads his young pioneers from troubled pasts to hopeful futures. And we stay on track because we know this works. We know this is making uh, an impact on, on children and making an impact on families. And that's going to influence the future and the way children are being treated in the next century. Coming up next on Heroes Made in the USA, Dr. Robert Gale saving Chernobyl burn victims and hometown hero Robert Turr. After the explosion of the nuclear power plant at Chernobyl, Dr. Robert Gale had a unique human experience. He saw firsthand the effects of a nuclear disaster. Only two of Dr. Gale's bone marrow transplant patients are still alive, but looking back one year later, he feels the success rate still justifies his efforts. These are people that you see a couple of times a day, young people that you're watching either get terribly ill and die or get terribly ill and recover. And so all of us forged very close personal relations with all of the victims and all of the survivors. April 26, 1986, in the dead of the Russian night, an explosion rips through the roof of Chernobyl reactor number four. The blast and the subsequent firestorm spew millions of times more radioactive contaminants into the atmosphere than the Three Mile Island accident. April 28, after a silence of two days, the Soviet government acknowledges the accident in a brief newscast. Dr. Robert Gale, one of the world's leading bone marrow transplant specialists, hears of the accident and forms a plan. He will go to the Soviet Union and help the victims. The president had already made an offer of humanitarian assistance, which had been declined by Mr. Gorbachev. And so I had to look for some direct route to the Soviets make an international offer, not an American offer, but an international offer. And I used my uh, relationship with Dr. Hammer to accomplish that. If anyone could get Gal into the Soviet Union to help the Chernobyl victims, it would be his friend, Dr. Armin Hammer. The American billionaire and humanitarian has been a friend and business partner of the Soviets since the days of Lenin, 
when he provided them a million bushels of American grain during a Russian famine. I got a telegram off to Mr. Gorbachev pointing out uh, who Dr. Yale was, and I vouched for him, and uh, that uh, I thought that he could leave the next day if, if I got there okay, and sure enough, the answer came back, send Dr. Yale. When Gale reached the Soviet Union, he found the greatest victims of Chernobyl were the greatest heroes of Chernobyl. The Russian firemen, who valiantly kept the blaze from spreading, were the most severely irradiated of the 500 victims housed in Moscow's Hospital No. 6. No one was and no one is allowed in Hospital 6. Soviets are very sensitive about this and have not permitted uh, anyone else into the uh, hospital building. For that reason, these personal photographs of Gales are the primary record of Chernobyl's legacy of radiation burns and sickness. Uh, many of the complications were all photographed by myself or by them, but there was no competition because they just wouldn't let anybody else in. The first thing one does is uh, to, something we call triage. That is, we, we identify a group of people that are so sick that they cannot be saved. On the other extreme are a group of people who have injuries, but who would probably recover regardless of what we do. Again, we want to give them good care, but we, we've got to focus our attention on the middle group, where their survival hinges on our intervention. Since radiation destroys the bone marrow's ability to generate healthy new blood cells, Gale and his team of Soviet and American physicians performed 13 bone marrow transplants. But Gale's efforts didn't stop with the bone marrow transplants. With Arm and Hammer's backing and using Hammer's personal jet, he organized an airlift of a million dollars worth of medical supplies to help the victims. But it is reassuring to know that of the 500 people that we had in the hospital, 471 recovered. Now the real experiment, or the real important long-term investigation is going to be what happens to the 135,000 people that were evacuated. What will be the incidence of additional cancers, additional birth defects, uh, additional, if any, genetic abnormalities? The Soviets evacuated everyone within 30 kilometers of Chernobyl, including the 50,000 residents of the city of Pripyat. We think that the range of excess cancers over the next 50 years may be something between two or 3,000 on the low side, and perhaps as many as 75,000 on the upper side. Um, now, it's important to understand that only half of those cancer deaths would occur in the Soviet Union. That is, the other half would occur outside, primarily in Europe, but also everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. This is because the Chernobyl firestorm pushed radioactive contaminants high into the atmosphere, where they were carried by winds and deposited by rain in areas thousands of miles from the Soviet power plant. And so one of the messages about these adverse consequences is that an accident anywhere is an accident everywhere. Chernobyl thrust Dr. Robert Gale into the hot spotlight of media attention in both the United States and the Soviet Union. And through this disaster, he has become an unlikely bridge between the two superpowers. I wrote with Dr. Hammer an op-ed piece for the New York Times, which was published the next weekend in Pravda and Izvestia. And that must be one of the first times that an American op-ed piece has been published verbatim in the Soviet Union. And in the final analysis, the fact that Americans were willing to help would serve us well and indirectly would serve the Soviets. On most days, pilot Robert Turr is flying above the city of Los Angeles covering the daily news from his helicopter. Recently, he witnessed a plane crash. And since he's also a paramedic, he put his camera down and administered emergency medical treatment to the three men involved in the crash. The fuel was flowing between my, <laughs> my ankles. We were able to uh, pull some debris off these people, hyperextend their necks, and they came too. It worked like, you know, like a charm. For taking the time to get involved to help his fellow man, L.A. News pilot Robert Turr is this week's hometown hero. From the Hollywood Bowl to the New West to the Soviet Union, American heroes are making us proud. 